We may develop addictions to medicinal and recreational drugs, alcohol, even eating or not eating. The symptoms and what can we do to help ourselves or our friends or family? Alcoholism and addiction, tonight, on call with the Prayer Doc, celebrating our 20th season. Hello, I'm Dr. Matt Stanley of the Avera Medical Group, University of Psychiatry in Sioux Falls. I'm delighted to be here as the host for tonight's On Call with the Prairie Doc program. To be part of the celebration of 20 seasons of truthful, tested, and timely medical information. Continuing that tradition is our goal for tonight's discussion. There are things that we really like, such as chocolate ice cream, then there are things that take like and turn it into need. These can be horribly destructive to a person's life, family, and relationships. Joining us tonight here in our studio on this South Dakota State University campus in Brookings is Dr. Vivek Anand of the Avera Medical Group, University of Psychiatry Associates in Sioux Falls. He focuses on child and adolescent psychiatry. Welcome, Vivek. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. Well, thank you for having me, Dr. Stanley. Uh, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, uh, and so I see a lot of children and adolescents with you know, mental health and substance use problems. Besides that, I also manage a practice where I see adults with mental illness, ranging from anxiety to schizophrenia, along with comorbid substance use disorders. I also um, help out uh, manage an addiction center uh, in Sioux Falls with the Vera Medical Group and I manage patients over there as well, which have both substance use disorders and uh, comorbid mental problems. Outstanding. It's a great range of experience, so I look forward to the conversation. And we look forward to answering your questions about addiction. Call 1-888-376-6225 send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org or ask on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. And to encourage your questions, those of you who ask a question during the first 20 minutes of tonight's program will be entered into a drawing for one of our Prairie Doc gift items. The winner will be announced at the end of this program. Your questions will remain anonymous, but be sure to provide your name and contact information when you submit your questions so we can contact the winner. So, I do have a few questions here. A caller from Brookings asks, is frequent cannabis use, for example, four to five times a day, unhealthy? Is it an addiction? Certainly, you. So, you know, uh, cannabis has, uh, is a very commonly used substance, and it's, uh, uh, the psychoactive nature of cannabis uh, makes it addictive. Uh, so, you know, all sorts of people, they can start off with recreational use and over time they use it more often in higher quantities and it tends to, you know, impair their occupation, their recreational life, their social life, uh, even leads to, you know, tolerance. People tend to uh, not get the same buzz with previously used amounts, so they keep on uh, using and increasing amounts and that eventually ends up in cannabis use disorder. Right. Uh, it has other hallmarks too, like you know, if you stop using cannabis, you can have withdrawal as well. Uh, and so it certainly has all flavors of a substance uh, which can cause addiction and uh, withdrawal. You, uh, and you just mentioned a couple of things we look for when we're diagnosing addiction. So tolerance, which is meaning you need more and more of the same substance to create the effect. Withdrawal, mm -hmm. which means when you stop the drug uh, uh, abruptly, you feel it physically. Um, but a lot of people are confused. They think that you can't, I think, be addicted to marijuana. You and I have both seen it. I think the other thing that concerns me about cannabis, uh, this is a wonderful question because I think a lot of people feel that it's a non-addictive drug uh, and also equate that with non-harmful. So there's a couple of studies out there. This remains somewhat controversial, but I noticed in JAMA, I think it was just, so the Journal of the American Medical Association, I think it was just last week, um, from one of the uh, Netherlands uh, countries where they have a very uh, 
broad and comprehensive population health documentation. Everyone's in socialized health, so they track their health care from birth to death. They looked at, the question they asked was, um, is cannabis use associated with uh, increased risk of schizophrenia and psychosis, as you just mentioned? Their theory was that because THC content, so the psychoactive component of marijuana has gotten stronger, and because use has increased, they would see an increase in uh, the schizophrenia. Uh, and in fact, they did find a three to four-fold increase in the diagnosis, which they did relate to uh, increased use of cannabis. So I think that's one thing that people uh, don't have a, an awareness of. We're talking about risk in the developing brain especially. Right. And uh, the other thing I think folks don't understand or, or sometimes is lost in the discussion, 18 is an arbitrary age of maturity. The brain actually isn't matured or fully developed uh, in males especially until 24, 25 years of age. Absolutely. So in the maturing brain, we know there are greater effects than there are in the, uh, in the adult or fully matured brain. In fact, you know, if folks are using marijuana earlier in their lifetimes, before 18, they're five to six times more likely to get addicted to that substance. Yeah. And using uh, drugs like uh, cannabis can prime their brain to use other substances and can act as a gateway. Yeah. Uh, and you know, besides psychosis, uh, there are studies that increases risk of depression. Some, a lot of people think that it helps out with anxiety, but it's the, op the other way around. It can worsen um, anxiety. And overall, you know, there have been studies, uh, there was one study comes to mind that was done in New Zealand uh, where uh, they measured their IQs over time and using cannabis uh, consistently over a period of time led to drop in IQ. Uh, and it certainly hurts memory. So people certainly do not have a good memory uh, and struggle with, you know, retaining information over time if they're using cannabis. Yeah, that was the study in Dunedin, New Zealand. Yes. And uh, yeah, so, between, so IQ is relatively static, but they looked at those that had started using heavily uh, uh, at age, I think the first IQ testing was around age 14, and they looked mm -hmm. to get them yes, at 38. Yeah, yeah. at 38. Yeah. And uh, not only had they dropped about eight points in IQ, but their uh, cohort had gained a couple, which right. is kind of a little bit atypical, but 10 point drop on a 100 point scale being normal. That's a significant, that a 10% loss is uh, incredible. If you took a 10% loss in your height, you'd be pretty upset. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it, uh, it is a significant uh, factor. Um, you know, we know marijuana use is out there and we know it's significant. Um, and it's interesting, I don't know what current studies and, and certainly uh, not uh, impugning any of the local college campuses, but if you look at rate of abuse, I think stimulants are still number one on college campus for abuse, uh, but marijuana has got to be rapidly gaining if it hasn't overtaken. And of course, alcohol's ubiquitous almost. Right. But um, is there any kind of safe use? That, like, have you ever heard of any guidelines for this is appropriate or this is safe? Appropriate is probably the wrong word. But we know we're reaching legalization in this right. state. So what should we tell? parents or patients? That, that, now that is a great question. You know, the problem is that there is no standardization of THC content in marijuana. So different marijuanas have different contents and this is unlike like a number of cigarettes per day or a number of uh, alcoholic drinks per day. So it's really hard to quantify. And over time, like you were saying, you know, initially in 1960s and 70s, marijuana THC potency was like four to five percent and now it's up to 14 percent. And the CBD that's, you know, plays somewhat of a protective role with THC, that has dropped. And lately, this is the day and age of marijuana vaping, uh, where, you know, these marijuana vaxes have potency up to 85%. Uh, so that, because there's lack of standardization, it's really hard to uh, quantify a, a safe dose, yeah, so to speak. absolutely. Yeah. It reminds me of one of the stories I heard from a Colorado ER, um, edibles. Are, are a, as you said, no standardization in what you smoke, but edibles are a whole other kind of level of difficult to judge. And, and one of the things that happens with edibles uh, a lot is, uh, so you don't feel it right away. Yeah. And so you keep taking yeah. the edible, and then finally when it starts hitting, it's intense. And uh, that's where you've had some, a few of those uh, really terrible outcome stories where um, they really got into a, a profound psychosis. The other thing that's interesting too, and I, don't, I um, I always found this physiologically interesting that 
you know, you think of uh, marijuana as reducing nausea, and it does, and it and it helps appetite. But there is a hyperemesis syndrome that can come with uh, with too much marijuana use, and it's really hard to treat. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think a cold shower is still about the only preferred treatment. <laughs> Uh, so people that just the hyperemesis, just meaning people that can't stop vomiting uh, because of the amount of THC they've been they've taken in. Yeah, yeah, and you know that is also related to how the chronic usage of marijuana affects your, uh, you know, different sorts of receptors. So uh, mainly there are two different kinds of receptors: one in the brain and one outside the brain. And over time, if you keep using cannabis, the ones in the brain get desensitized, but the one in the gut. Uh, they keep on working, and that leads to emesis and uh, you know pain, uh, and which is hard to treat. Uh, but uh, the only treatment is to abstain from marijuana. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, have you? I know we both treat folks with addictions, but like, what, what do you tell someone when they're trying to stop marijuana? Which which I think we'd both admit we don't see commonly. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a fairly challenging thing uh, because. You know, to use or not use, uh, you have to help the patient find their motivation. Uh, and so it is essentially the motivation to change. Most people, when I see them in my clinic, uh, they do not want to change because they do not realize the harms or the consequences of marijuana use over time. So the first thing that I do is, you know, help them develop some sort of an insight into their use. And over time, you know, they learn the consequences you know, it could be like failure in academics, you know, poor functioning, uh, you know, getting into conflicts at home, in, in their friend network. And uh, over time, they realize that uh, it is better to change than to uh, stay where they are. And once they find that motivation, then we can help them out uh, with, there are some medications, but mostly, you know, uh, therapy um, groups and, you know, individual therapies uh, are much more helpful. It's one of the reasons I think it's so challenging when you're working with adolescents because, as you said, I, you know, when we're teaching our residents or when we're talking to family groups or things, it's almost always consequences that get people to look at change. So they've had a legal disaster or a relationship disaster, they're going to lose their job or a financial disaster. But kids are kind of bulletproof at 13, 14, 15. They don't like health care, their health concerns are nil, they're always gonna, they always feel like they're gonna get better, legal things are, you know, kind of transient, they don't have jobs, school performance, eh. yeah, yeah. it's just hard to find that lever, right. uh, that one motivation or that consequence that will convince them to change. Right. It, it can be a challenging group right. to work right. with. And you know, lack of consequential thinking, that's also related to their brain uh, being under development. And like you mentioned, you know, it can be up to mid-20s. Uh, that their brains are mature enough uh, to realize the harms that may come with it. Yeah. Well, and, and in marijuana specifically, I know, um, you know, I have a lot less concern about fully mature adults who decide they want to use marijuana. Um, if, you know, I will say this, so as a physician, I'm, I'm not convinced there's a whole lot of conditions that are going to improve with marijuana, but I'm also not too concerned if people in their 50s or 60s want to use some you know, some recreational marijuana or yeah. medicinal marijuana. Yeah. It's well, in regards to well, recreational marijuana, you know, there's I certainly cannot provide any recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> but, Not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but medical marijuana, there is some evidence yeah. that in a chronic pain, especially uh, if with you know cancer populations and in your advanced years, uh, has helped with quality of life and pain intensity. Uh, and you know general well-being. Yeah, I would say my biggest concern with the legalization is is if it will make the drug more accessible to youth. People again going back to yes. that developing brain yes. and the concerns in that. Yes. You know, we do have a question from Amber Dean, and uh, it, it's a difficult one, and, and uh, but very germane. It's can you explain why some people get addicted and others do not? That is a great question. So uh, it depends on a lot of factors. So addiction is a 40 to 60 percent genetic. So you know there is some genetic input that goes into developing addiction over time. Then you know there's interaction with environment, uh, and then on top of that, if there are epigenetic changes like you know trauma uh, and things of that nature, they can increase the odds of developing dependence or, or you know substance use disorder. And uh, that could be the differentiating factor uh, of, uh, you know, for one person to develop uh, addiction and the other to just use it uh, safely, recreationally, and, and, and abstain for it, from it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's part of the piece that's hard to understand. So there's some studies, and I know you've seen them, where they will give a stimulant uh, to people with three different kind of genetic um, uh, neurochemical mm -hmm. makeups, and each will rate how, how much they like the drug. Mm -hmm. And if you have the wrong receptors, you're going to love that drug, and you're almost instantly uh, hooked on it. Right, right. However, if you have plenty of dopamine already circulating and you don't have those receptors, you're kind of like, ah, that made me uncomfortable. Right. So one of the things I've always taken away from that is, you know, you can't look at somebody else and their use and say, well, that must be safe, or they're able to use it responsibly. They have a very different genetic uh, right. environment in which that drug is going to operate. Absolutely. So, so actually, I heard a good geneticist once tell me, when you, the next time you see someone addicted to something, don't, don't shame them. Say, there but for the grace of God go I. Because it is, to your point, it's exposure to the right environment or wrong environment, mm -hmm. the genetic environment, and then it's all the other things that have made up your life. We know that past trauma or a psychiatric illness can make you more vulnerable. Right. We know the younger you start, or as you already mentioned, can make you more vulnerable. So. Right. It is a complex question. We've yeah. simplified it probably as much as we can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so starting use early increases the risk. Having any sort of uh, psychiatric diagnosis increasing the, increases the risk. If there's, uh, you know, changes in the genes, uh, you know, from the genetic insult, uh, that can, uh, you know, increase the odds. So you know, all these factors in, in tandem um, work uh, for somebody to get addicted or somebody to not be addicted. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well. Successful businessman Greg Sands tells his story of overcoming addiction and how he has helped other patients to the road of recovery. Prairie Doc reporter Esther Michael shares Greg's history. It's an insidious, relentless disease that has been hard to crack and I believe society and the United States as a whole has made a lot of advancements in recovering from addiction. I believe that society views addiction today much more so as a disease than, you know, 40 years ago it was a moral deficiency. And today in some people's mind it's still a moral deficiency. And today we know that it, it is a disease and it's, um, and it's very deadly. Greg grew up in a broken home and was exposed to drugs at a young age. However, just as his life was taking a turn for the worse, Greg realized his prison sentence for dealing drugs was necessary to exit the deadly path he was on. The reason I feel it's important to do is being of service to God and others is one of the things that helps me maintain my stability. And it keeps me grounded. And it keeps me humble. You know, and it's paramount for, for my own uh, success in life and in recovery and is being of service to others. And the desire to do so is deep-seated. Addiction knows no face. It will ruin your life and kill you, regardless of your financial means, your status in the community, your status in life. You know, there's no... Addiction is not prejudice. Ten years later, Greg received a presidential pardon. He then invested his time and resources with the Avera Addiction Care Center to help people through their experiences along the way to recovery. If I can recover from this, anybody can. Because no one thought I could, and, and I didn't think I could, and, and, I di and I'm doing okay today, you know, right now. And it's the, I think the best thing that I tell them is that there's hope for this, that this disease can be arrested at some point and recovery is then possible. And because when families or addicts come to me, what they don't have is hope. And that was one of the funnest things about being part of building the Avera Addiction Center is we had that conversation that we want to bring hope to our clients as they come in. Wonderful story, Greg Sands is a very courageous man to share that with us. What What do you think? Uh, and I know you're you're heavily involved, actually, with the program that he was talking about. What What do you think the impact uh, on the effectiveness of a program of this type is if it includes a former addiction patient or patients? 
So it certainly helps if you have a peer who has uh, gone through a similar uh, you know, state of mind, so to speak, or you know, suffers from a similar brain disorder. Uh, it uh, it helps to connect. It helps in psychological identification with uh, with the with the other user, and that helps out uh, the person with you know not stigmatizing their own use, and also uh, to know that you know treatments are helpful and yeah. treatments work over time. Uh, so it does help out with uh, you know getting motivation uh, and and you know some sort of encouragement to abstain over time and yeah. be successful at that. Wonderful points. Yeah. You know, it, it is interesting in, in healthcare. We, we're kind of used to uh, when you have a medical problem, you go to your primary care, care doc and he leads you to the right source of treatment for that condition. I think we both discovered an addiction. There's, there's kind of a whole other community out there that uh, shares stories and leads each other to treatment or help. Um, in other words, that when we have patients come in for addiction, it's often not through traditional channels. Someone they've talked to someone who's in recovery or they know is in recovery. So that whole concept of peer support exists not just in AA, but just there is a community out there trying to help others. And, and Greg Sands a great example. Right, right. Because you know most times you know folks who are drinking alcohol are spending time with other people who are drinking alcohol, and uh, they don't know that that most of them or a majority of them are struggling with alcohol use disorder. And if one of them gets treatment, so there's, you know, it kind of tr trickles down into their, the, the network, so to speak, and it helps out most of them. Yeah. I think and the other thing it points to, too, is it's sometimes hard to navigate. If you're, if you're a, a family member of someone with an addiction or yourself have an addiction, you don't really know how to enter into care. There, it's not as clear cut. In fact, that was one of the questions I was just looking at this. Um, uh, it, it's kind of uh, related, but... Um, Question is, a woman is wondering, how do you get a person to admit they have an alcohol problem? Oh, uh, that's great. Uh, you know, most times people struggle with understanding how to quantify alcohol. Uh, so, you know, uh, National Institute of Health has defined that there are limits in how you define a standard drink. Uh, so uh, there's a, a moderate level of drinking, which is one drink per day for women and not more than two drinks for men per day. So if they're exceeding that, uh, they are already going up the moderate levels of drinking. Now there's binge drinking and heavy drinking. So if somebody's drinking five days, so if a male uh, is drinking five drinks or more days in a day, now that is heavy drinking. And if a female does that for four or more drinks, that's also heavy drinking. And if they do that within hour of within two hours, that's binge drinking. So all these maladaptive drinking patterns are suggestive of uh, uh, addiction or alcohol use disorder. So that would be one way. But you know, there are other crude measures to identify if alcohol is affecting somebody's life, and those would be you know uh, their the impact of alcohol on their occupational life. So. For example, they would be missing out on work, they would be in a hangover, they will be calling in sick, uh, their efficiency will decline, they will not be as productive, they won't have time for family, uh, there will be frequent conflicts, they will be hiding their drinks most times, they will be drinking in secrecy, they won't have time for their children or socializing or to go to church, and all those things uh, point towards you know, some sort of a problem. Uh, and eventually, if this continues, it can, uh, it can translate into physical effects. There can be uh, problems with their liver, their heart. Uh, if somebody's having high blood pressure, they're drinking, well, probably high blood pressure is related to their drinking. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it translates into mental health problems and other concerns. And those are like big pointers to know well somebody is struggling with their alcohol use, uh, but has poor insight. So that person themselves are not able to uh, acknowledge or, or recognize uh, but then that's the responsibility of their network or family or friends to, uh, to motivate them uh, to first accept it and, and then to intervene. Yeah, I think you, you kind of painted a broad tapestry there of things that could help. Uh, it can, it's really hard sometimes to just find a compelling single arg argument for somebody to convince them they need to get help. We're, we're all kind of now familiar with the concept of interventions, and a lot of times that's where that where a family or loved ones have kind of hit the point where they just don't know what else to do. They can't get the person to mm -hmm. acknowledge it. So, and and a lot of times I think we both know it's a process, and and developing insight can be kind of a process. So, I think I think it is worthwhile to bring up the concern. Uh, you may be disappointed you don't get immediate uh, acknowledgement or response, but at least you've 
open the door for that person to start contemplating right, it. Right, right. Confrontation should be the last thing yeah, uh, absolutely to do. Agree. Uh, you know, having empathy for them and understanding their use from their perspective uh, helps out considerably. But sometimes, you know, problems pro tr trickle outside of the household or outside of their family or friend network, and the law may get involved. You know, they can they they get a DUI or they uh, they get into you know other uh, consequence related to lack of judgment, uh, some sort of yeah. assault or uh, other indiscretions, and that would also be a marker for. Uh, you know, pursuing health, help. As tragic as yeah. it is, I think you, both of us have seen that legal charges have been about as compelling in terms of number of people that it sends yeah. into treatment and yeah. any other intervention I can think of. Absolutely. So you hate to see it get to that point. So this viewer is wondering, is there a medical treatment for alcoholism like there is for opioid addiction? Absolutely. So uh, the medical treatment uh, is is broad, you know. So there are medications and that there, there are uh, therapies. Uh, there are multiple kinds of therapies, you know, motivational enhancement therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. Those those are delivered by experts, uh, and we have a lot of them at, at at Avera Health and in particular at the Addiction Center. But then, in particular, there are three medications approved by the FDA to look at these um, alcohol outcomes. And uh, the, all of them work differently. Uh, so there are standard treatments uh, to help with alcoholism over time. Yeah, and some of those too, as you said, we, we talked about, you know, we didn't talk extensively about how alcohol can change the brain. But one of the things that's hard about withdrawal or overcoming your craving is just the imbalances you've created in your brain. The, so the body and the brain are always trying to reachieve stasis or balance. Mm -hmm. And so when you're adding alcohol daily, you know, you're, the, the chemicals your body produces change to try to balance that out. Well, when you stop drinking, you've got this uh, irritating uh, kind of neurotransmitter that's gotten pumped way up because you've been putting this inhibitory uh, drug in mm -hmm. all this mm -hmm. time. Uh, so we have drugs that help with that way. We have drugs that help with uh, craving in a different way on the, directly on receptors. So yeah. there are treatments. None of them, though, probably work without uh, some form of what you were just describing. Psychosocial treatment. Yep. Yeah. 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 And you know, outside of the FDA-approved treatments, there are other treatments that we that we utilize, and uh, most of them are off-label. But there are many treatments available for alcohol use disorder. Yeah, and sometimes it, it may be hard to find a prescriber that that uses those a lot. But I think if you can get to an addiction program, you're more likely to find those, or or someone who has an interest in addictions. Absolutely. Probably underutilized, I would say, overall. Yeah, so I would say, you know, nine out of 100 people get offered any sort of medication treatment for alcohol use disorder, so very underutilized. Yeah. And even when it's utilized, the dosing uh, and, you know, the, the, the expertise is, is probably lacking. Or if it's prescribed, it's prescribed in isolation without any sort of psychosocial treatments. Uh, right. And that, uh, that can be a problem over time. Because, we're just not talking about detoxification. I mean, recovery can take up to three to five years. And uh, uh, so it's a long, it's a chronic sort of a disease. It's chronic brain disease. And it alcohol, is. every time you're drinking heavy amounts, you're, you're injuring your brain uh, voluntarily. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, you know, if you injure your brain over time, it certainly needs years to recover from all those bad effects too. Well, and I, and I think that's sometimes what confuses people when they're in recovery. They think I've been sober for a month and I still feel terrible. I still can't think straight. Um, it does take a year or more for the neurochemistry itself just to straighten out. Your, your comment, though, about uh, the underutilization of prescription drugs kind of just made me think about something you just touched on. That you know, even in healthcare, we're not necessarily good at recognizing this for what it is, which is a chronic disease. We talk more about that, but I think that's part of where um, stigma plays in. Maybe uh, um, there's always a lot of emotions around addiction because it impacts and sometimes hurts so many people. Uh, I've, I think I've actually had uh, families get angry with me a little bit when I say that it's a it's a disease. Your your dad has a disease, mm -hmm. um, but the but when I describe it as a disease, I'm not implying that the patient themselves doesn't have a responsibility to care for themselves and help overcome the disease. Right. Um, so we're not taking away, uh, I guess, ownership of the illness, which is, I think, what sometimes frustrates families because they get so emotionally um, angry sometimes, frustrated right. with the right. person with the addiction. Yeah. 
Yeah. And sometimes, you know, when I come across such situations, I discuss other, you know, parallels with other disease models, you know, right. diabetes, hypertension, all have, you know, genetic input like uh, substance use disorders or alcohol use disorder in that, this case, uh, equal rates of relapse, uh, equal input from genetics, equal interaction with environment. I mean, there is, there are certain things that we can do. So, for example, if somebody is high blood pressure, well, yeah, uh, they can eat healthy, exercise, and similar thing with uh, with substance use disorders. They can take measures to uh, not relapse and uh, and help their recovery over time. Right. Any chronic medical disease requires a lot of input from the patient in order to fully recover. Absolutely. There's no, there's no difference yeah. in that with yeah. alcoholism. Yeah. I do want to make clear, just the, the patient asked, or, or I'm sorry, the patient, the uh, person asked if there was treatment like opioid. So opioid, uh, our most common treatment is a little different than what we use in alcohol, right. as in medication-assisted treatment, which is, it's really kind of replacing uh, the opioid, uh, well, we're actually using an opioid, but of a safer uh, type, a safer formulation. We don't have anything quite like that in, in alcohol use, where there's kind of a substitute for the drug. Yeah, so you know, in opioids, we are, you know, so opioids are working on a certain receptor, activating that receptor and causing all those changes. Uh, but we are using other medications with similar profiles, but those medications are much more longer acting, mm -hmm. and that's why you don't need the, you don't have the need to kind of use them over and over, uh, and they they help out over over long times. Alcohol, unfortunately, we do we do not. But we use similar kinds of medications when we are helping somebody uh, from alcohol withdrawal. Uh, so then right. we are using uh, things like benzodiazepines, barbiturates, uh, and those kind of mimic uh, the action of alcohol. But over time, when we are looking at you know recovery and outside of detoxification, mm -hmm. uh, we have to use different kinds of medications for obvious reasons that you described um, in regards with the imbalance of of the neurotransmitters. Yeah. yeah. So we use a drug that kind of mimics it for the short term right. to make them safely through the detox with alcohol. With with the opioids, we're using a similar drug um, long term, oftentimes, yeah. just to provide a better safety for the patient. Because one of the things that's the f most frightening thing about the opioids is you have no idea what you get when you're buying it off the street, and there are some incredibly potent drugs out there that absolutely. will yeah. absolutely kill you. Yeah. The mo you know, within seconds of Absolutely. inhaling them. And that's again the question of standardization, the potency. Potency of alcohol stays the same, True. Uh, but opioids, it differs. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the, each day and year, you know, new opioids uh, get pumped into the market and, uh, uh, and cause problems. Yeah, commonly, uh, unfortunately, cut with super powerful drugs like fentanyl, which yeah. uh, can cause an immediate overdose. <laughs> this is a little this is a little technical, but let's see how we do here. And, and maybe this has to do we we're, we're describing different um, amounts for men and women, which is based more on their uh, physiology okay. than on um, gender so okay. much. But okay. um, so the question is, how much alcohol is consumed to cause an individual to become inebriated based on age, weight, and gender? Good question. So, you know, that depends on a lot of factors. So, when somebody drinks alcohol, alcohol is metabolized further. So, it's metabolized into something called acetaldehyde, which is again metabolized into acetic acid. Acetaldehyde is the, is the chemical that gives you the hangovers and, uh, you know, just the ill effects of, uh, of, of alcohol. Uh, so, uh, Sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. how do you, like... Yeah, how, why is it different for, for women? Yeah, or yeah, age yeah. or sex, yeah. yeah. So, you know, women generally metabolize alcohols at a slower pace. Uh, so what, what that means is that, you know, the, uh, the concentration of alcohol rises. Mm -hmm. The thing about women is, though, they take time to develop alcohol use disorder, but when they develop alcohol use disorder, they develop it very fast. So they have worse outcomes over time, which we refer to as telescoping. Uh, but yeah, so it's kind of differential metabolism between men and women, mm -hmm. besides the fact that men have larger body sizes and alcohol is distributed throughout the body, you know, right. that's how it impairs all the body functions. Uh, so those two uh, uh, are big differences between, you know, different recommendations by NIH. Yeah. And a little bit different absorption even at the gut level. Yes. For men and women. Well, a new facility in Sioux Falls has helped many people with their addiction and path to recovery. Prairie Doc reporter Carter Schmidt 
takes you to the Link Community Triage Center to learn more. Conversations to open a new triage center in Sioux Falls started over 10 years ago. Well, they did a lot of research and data collection trying to better understand our um, population, the people that live here and how we can best serve them. And then over the course of many years, um, the collaboration continued, the fundraising continued, um, but really um, the heart of the project is reliant upon these four partners, um, each contributing $400,000 annually. Those partners include Minnehaha County, the City of Sioux Falls, Sanford Health, and Avera Health. Early on, they realized that power of alignment was important. Uh, it was going to create a unique uh, experience for those involved with and also for the patients. And uh, the competition is, you know, not part of that. We're meant to kind of join together and it creates, you know, kind of this unity for the individuals that are getting their services here as well. So we're a 24-7 service. Uh, we can help anybody that has needs related to addiction care, mental health. Um, we do offer triage services, so the ability to come in and talk with a healthcare professional anytime um, about concerns that you have, issues that you're going through. The link opened its doors June 1st. We have met almost 500 unique individuals and we have completed over 1,200 triage assessments and that number grows every day. It doesn't mean that all of those individuals stayed and participated in one of our programs. Um, many of them did, um, but oftentimes we end up referring individuals to other levels of care in the community or a higher level of care if they have a complicated behavioral or medical need that we can't safely manage within our facility. For individuals with an addiction needing detox, the link provides more comfort on their path to recovery with a facility on its own rather than attached to a local jail like it used to be. When I would talk to some of those patients or some of those individuals that ended up attending services, uh, in that facility, they truly felt that they were incarcerated and they really couldn't separate that feeling of uh, incarceration and getting onto the right path. They felt that they were still on kind of the wrong path. So having the link in the location that it is, it's now detached from any uh, jail facility that they, they have a lot better feeling and I think a lot better outlook at what they're, what they're doing and what they're working towards. Miller says some people may have a relapse, but that continued support on the road to recovery is important. We don't see this as a one and done kind of situation. It's amazing if that can happen that way for people, but it's usually not the case. It usually takes um, just continued support and monitoring and really just coming alongside that individual because we know that life um, brings all kinds of curveballs. So it looks like a wonderful program. I know we both had a little experience with that. You know, one of the things that uh, Nurse Miller was mentioning there was it's not a one and done. That many people, um, you know, it, it's a it's a journey to recovery. It's not a, a treat and uh, and you're well again. Do you any comments on that? I think that's frustrating for many. Yeah, yeah. So you know, talking from the you know the research standpoint. Uh, uh, if folks have been able, so the first 90 days are the most toughest days. You know, that's that's when most folks are going to relapse and start using all over again. If you're able to maintain abstinence for up to one year, you are amongst those 30 per, 33% of the people who are going to stay abstinent. If you're able to move it further to three-year mark, you're going to be one of the 66% of people who are going to keep abstaining and not resort back to using those substances. But the bigger point is the five-year mark. If you make it up to the five-year mark, then your 85% ch chances uh, that you will not be using uh, that substance again. So you see, I mean, it starts from detoxification up to that three to five-year mark to achieve 85% probability of not using that substance again. Uh, so it is a work in progress. Yeah, it is. You know, I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who is recovering. He's a wonderful person, and uh, he's had a very successful recovery. We were talking about just kind of what, just what we were talking about, that um, it's always in the, in the back of his mind. It's something he has to be conscious of every day because a relapse can happen at any time. Yeah. He actually turned to me and said, you know, Matt, I'm just tired of being an addict every day of my life. Because every day, even though he's 20 plus years of sober, 
he has to take into consideration the fact that he's at risk. It is an ongoing, whether you're in recovery or whether you're trying to recover, it's a daily uh, discipline, really. Right. And cravings sometimes never go away. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, when you are using a substance, uh, you have so many other stimuli when you're using. So if you're listening to a particular song, if you're watching a certain movie, if you're hanging out with certain in a certain bar, yeah. and all those brain circuits fire together. Yeah. And things that fire together get strong together. So if you get rid of the alcohols, uh, for example, uh, if you, let's say, if you have not had alcohol for 10 years, but you listen to that song while you're driving a car, you are going to have some cravings. Yeah. Uh, and so cravings usually stick around. And that's where you have to use your coping skills uh, to distract yourself yeah. uh, into you know, more uh, productive things. It's an important point because abstinence alone rarely is sufficient to be successful. Yes. You have to learn some tools. You have to be able to handle those triggers. Absolutely. And that's where, you know, psychosocial uh, therapies along with medications, that's, that's where they make their mark. This is an interesting question we had come in, and I want to see what your thoughts are on this. Uh, a woman wants to try a dose of CBD to see if it would help arthritis. Suggestions on how to start? Oh, <laughs> well, first, you know, there's not a whole lot of research on cannabis oil, yeah. uh, CBD, uh, and uh, there, there is some research looking at mental health outcomes, and it turns out that there is some help with, you know, when it comes to schizophrenia, maybe anxiety, but looking at pain outcomes, uh, there are no research to suggest use of CBD oil. Uh, there, there is research to suggest THC, uh, the cannabis uh, for pain outcomes like we were talking about earlier, but that's in advanced years when folks have cancer and other terminal illnesses. So talking about CBD and making recommendations is somewhat premature at this time. Yeah, I, I would struggle with that one too. Uh, I understand when you have something that's as um, painful and chronic as arthritis, yeah. you're probably looking for right. some level of hope. Yeah. I, I would just say whatever you do, Go slow and conservative. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes when you're anxious, uh, the pain, it hurts more. Yeah, it, absolutely. Uh, so if it, it can probably help out indirectly, but uh, there is no evidence to suggest that so far. Yeah, so here's a, another one, interesting one. Caller calling, uh, really asking for help, asking, can you suggest some words I might use to help me start a conversation with a friend about excessive alcohol use? Should I set up a time and place to meet her or just surprise her with the conversation? Well, so this, these conversations need to happen with regular everyday conversations uh, where you are trying to elicit, uh, the, the, you know, you're trying to develop insight into the person's alcohol use and how that is affecting. Uh, surprise visits or surprise conversations, confrontations, they usually do not work out and put the person at their defense or you know, they become defensive about them and uh, uh, that does not help with engagement and treatment. But you can always help a uh, you know, help them out by understanding why they're using, how it's affecting uh, their health, and if they would like to change. Uh, sometimes people like to change, but uh, they are so strongly addicted to, uh, to substances that it's hard to um, stay away from them. Yeah, I, I think some open-ended, non-judgmental, you know, um, supportive mm -hmm. statements, you know, I, you know, something as simple as, you know, I've been worried about your health lately. Uh, do you feel like everything's okay? And you can slowly work that around maybe to a conversation about alcohol, but I think the big things are don't be judgmental, um, don't rush to judgment, don't try to elicit a response immediately that's, yeah. that you're looking for. It's gonna take time and it's right. a conversation. Yeah. yeah, Be a good listener and reach out uh, as a helping hand. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I love that. A caller from Lake Norton wants to know some of the signs of addiction to alcohol. I know you've covered a little bit in our conversation, but any any kind of yeah, so Concise. hallmarks would be you know, a person deviating from their normal, regular functioning, and that functioning uh, would uh, go through a spectrum of different th things that you know, people function at. So it can be from occupation, their social life, family life, how they relate with their children, how productive they are, how energetic, or you know, if they want to go out for football games, if they want to hang out with kids and work with, with them for their projects, they want to go out for a movie or dinner with their wives, all that functioning gets affected when somebody's using substances to the point they stop taking care of themselves, activities of daily living, uh, all those are markers and indicators for uh, some sort of a suspicion towards substance use disorders. Yeah, in psychiatry we really kind of define pathology when it impairs your ability to function. 
That's kind of where that line is for us. So here's an interesting one. There's a discussion on a national level about pills laced with fentanyl. Are you seeing this in South Dakota and how can a parent best stress to their child to abstain from taking pills? Right. So we have had isolated cases of pills laced with fentanyl. The bigger problem that we are facing is illegally compressed fentanyl pills uh, being uh, mailed from East Coast. Uh, so that certainly we have seen a lot. And uh, my understanding is from those uh, patients that those are in, uh, in quite a circulation around Sioux Falls area. Yeah, I know that you know as well as I, 2020 we had a 30% increase in overdose deaths across the United States. Tremendously high number, frightening. Probably had time for one more question. A viewer is wondering, are there any new drugs or recent breakthroughs for treating mental health? Is there any new drug on the horizon? Well, new drugs are always in development. Uh, it's, a, it's a long, a painful way to uh, get them approved by the FDA. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple, multiple medications for substance use disorders and other uh, psychiatric disorders that, are, that research is ongoing for. Yeah, I, w I would say that uh, I don't know of any right in the end of the pipeline right now, but I know there's a great deal more interest in addiction in general. We are looking more at the neurochemistry and trying to figure out where in that chain of events, as you described, it's, it's quite complex, but uh, where we might be able to have interventions that right. might be more helpful. Right. Right. Yeah, there have been certain several experimental medications, including injections, long-acting formulations, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, to get them FDA approved and um, get them ready for use, yeah. that's, uh, that's, that's a far shot at this time. And I think the one thing to stress to our viewers is there will probably never be a drug that you just take and solve your addiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, even you think of even hypertension, drugs will can kind of immediately right. bring your blood pressure down. Right. There is really uh, very few, if any, medications that right. I look for on the immediate horizon that right. are going to be right. that immediately effective right. for addictions. Yeah, you know, addiction is a very complex phenomenon. I mean, it's a it's a chronic disease, but uh, it is make, causing acute changes in the brain. And those brain changes, they, are, they, they remain there for a long period of time, and that makes it complex. And brain is such a plastic organ, it changes, uh, reforms, uh, and, and that is a challenge uh, that we come across when we are designing medications for substance use disorders. Uh, in contrast to this, if somebody's on hypertension uh, medications, well, their receptors stay the same. They are not changing like uh, brain changes. Right, right. Our brain today is different than how it was yesterday. We learned so many new things and forgot well, some. <laughs> yeah, wonderful point. The winner, of, the winner of our drawing tonight is Rick from Sioux Falls. Thank you, Rick, for asking a question during the first 20 minutes of the show. A gift will be sent to you. We'll be back after this. Alcoholism and addiction overall isn't a character of flaw or a weakness of self-control. It's a disease. And if you're like most of us, you've probably been affected by it. Maybe you struggle with alcohol consumption yourself or have a friend or family member who does. I rarely talk with anyone who doesn't have a personal story about how addiction has affected their life. In fact, about 14 million adults have an alcohol use disorder and there are about 95,000 alcohol-related deaths every year in this country. Unfortunately, we don't think of it like any other medical illness, so we don't usually talk to our primary care doctor about it. But that is one of the best places to start the conversation. During your yearly checkup, when you're talking about health goals, it is okay to say, I think I have a drinking problem. Some of the warning signs to look for in yourself or in a loved one include sacrificing family bonds for your addiction, such as missing a child's ball game, a concert, or graduation. Things that you were once passionate about fall by the wayside. You're fatigued and foggy, barely able to get up in the morning. You have cravings for the substance. You're counting down the time until you can get off work and have a drink. You're in danger of losing your job or important relationships or you've gotten in trouble with the law. 
You tell yourself and others that you could easily quit and will, but you never do. By starting the conversation, you will have a clearer path toward the help you need. Your doctor can guide you to outpatient counseling or support groups, or perhaps treatment at a facility. There is overlap between behavioral health and addiction in terms of risk factors. Much like behavioral health, addiction has an approximate 60% genetic heritability. Mental health conditions and a history of trauma put you at a greater risk of addiction. And like so many health conditions, the earlier you start, the worse the disease. Those who begin drinking before age 15 have a five times greater risk of developing an alcohol use disorder. I've spent my career talking about and treating addiction. I see that the conversation is changing and I'm heartened by it. There is a rising social consciousness about addiction. More and more we're willing to have candid and productive conversations about it. The next time your doctor asks you about alcohol consumption, take that as a prompt to have an honest conversation. Thank you to our guest, Vivek, for volunteering his time to help us learn more about recognition and treatment of addiction. A reminder for all of us, we are entering, entering the influenza season here in the upper Midwest. If you are getting a COVID vaccination, it is safe to get the flu vaccine at the same time. Please make plans to get your flu vaccine soon. This is also the time when many of us travel south for the winter. Being outside of South Dakota does not mean you have to miss our live programs. Each of our weekly episodes is streamed live on our Facebook page. Tune in each Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time and you can still call in your questions. As we continue to celebrate our 20th season, we invite you, our viewers, to tell us how this program has made a difference in your life. Please email or mail your story to the addresses on the screen. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please Please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper and be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. And as we celebrate our 20th season of truthful, tested, and timely medical information, from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Farming is a way of life, often going back multiple generations. This lifestyle comes with its share of dangers, from physical injuries to psychiatric concerns. Farm health, next time, on call with the Prairie Doc, celebrating our 20th season. Healing Words Foundation board member Dr. Ken Bartholomew from Pier is nearing the completion of his kayak challenge on the Missouri River. He began last fall, and despite three cancer surgeries, he continued his journey this spring and summer. He looks forward to paddling the final leg soon. I instituted this challenge last fall to try to keep Prairie Doc on the air, and we need your donations to help do that. This will help keep advertisement-free medical education coming to the public. Won't you accept the challenge and support us with 10 cents, 25 cents, 50 or even a dollar per mile of the 411 miles I plan to have covered? Go to prairie.org and click on the donate button or mail your donation to PO Box 752, Brookings, South Dakota. Be sure to include the word kayak in the memo. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. 
Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Peer District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Orthopedic Institute, Lake Ponset Saline Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftell Communications.